Um, and I'm going to let Roland do his own introduction and let him take over. Awesome. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here and get this set up. So just give me a second. Um, all right, so can everyone see the... Um, let me just try this one more time. I'm not sure. We can see it. Can you see just my presentation though? Or are you seeing notes? Um, no, we were just seeing your presentation. Now we're oh, just okay. seeing you. Now you're just seeing me. Well, let me try this again here. Mm -hmm. Sorry. I have uh, two monitors going and uh, clearly sometimes I have trouble with that. Uh, let me make sure I do this right, share that one. And then let's see this. All right. Um, so I want to um, start today by quickly thanking uh, Mass College of Art and Karen uh, for organizing and hosting um, this this talk today and this and this larger uh, symposium on indigo. Um, and um, today I want to um, talk with you, um, obviously, about the color blue. Um, and why I continue to work with this indigo process that I learned as an apprentice um, in Japan over 20 years ago. So for me, um, when you sort of writ large, indigo really provides a lens to examine and challenge our inherent biases towards a system that tends to see the value of a thing through what it offers us in terms of economic gain. And I really think that it's a system that's tricked us into seeding our values, our respect of others, and it's now really threatening the, the life of the planet that we live on. And yet, in 2023, we still remain under this system spell as we have for the past 400 years, as we've worked to build better, faster, more efficient, and more exploitative ways of propelling ourselves even more quickly, quickly towards our own self-destruction. But... Really, what I want to talk with you all about today is just the color blue. So as an artist, um, my life's been really deeply rooted in a craft craft tradition. And um, and so I really um, identify with, with craft and making. And as such, I'm a bit of an outsider in the art world. But it really does seem to me now more than ever um, that, that being in an artist is really important. Um, like I said earlier, when our unbridled greed is destroying the planet we live on and when our leaders weigh the value of the economy against the lives of others, many of us are left uncertain of the humanity of our collective future. So it seems to me that it's now more than ever that art matters, for art is possibility. It's the overlooked, the discarded, the idea, the hope, the impossible made manifest in the face of systems and beliefs they constantly try to prove otherwise. Um, American photographer Carrie Mae Weems said it best in a recent interview, so I'm just gonna quote her here. She said that the best art, the most progressive art, even when it's not political, serves to remind us of the complexity of our lives and the complexity of our humanity. And in doing so, that alone calls up the moral question of our social contract with one another. That if I'm deeply aware of my humanity, then I must also be aware of yours. In her book, Bluets, American poet Maggie Nelson writes, long before either wave or particle, some Pythagoras, Euclid, Hipparchus thought that our eyes emitted some kind of substance that illuminated or felt what we saw. Aristotle pointed out that this hypothesis runs into trouble at night as objects become invisible despite the eye's purported power. Others like Epicurus propose the inverse, that objects themselves project a kind of ray that reaches out towards the eye as if they were looking at us, and surely some of them are. Plato split the difference and postulated that a visual fire burns between our eyes and that which they behold. This still seems fair enough. For no one really knows what color is, where it is, even whether it is. Can it die? Does it have a heart? 
Think of a honeybee, for instance, flying into the folds of a poppy. It sees a gaping violet mouth where we see an orange flower and assume that it's orange, that we're normal. Nelson continues, when I talk about color and hope or color and despair, I'm not talking about the red of a stoplight, a periwinkle line on the white felt oval of a pregnancy test, or a black sail strung from a ship's mast. I'm trying to talk about what blue means or what it means to me apart from meaning. So as an indigo farmer in Dyer, I imagine the discovery of indigo by humans thousands of years ago is one of pure amazement. Plucked from the plants and squished, the indigen so long concealed in the leaves makes contact with the air and oxidizes, turning blue. The squished leaves wash off, but that blue remains, a reminder of how we fundamentally as humans have engaged with, learned from, and evolved because of the world around us. And in a primal way, this gets at the heart of my own interest in natural dyes and indigo in particular. The idea that through the discovery of colors concealed in plants and through the process of transferring that color to cloth, I have a window through which to rediscover the world I inhabit. It's a simple premise, really, that like whoever it was who discovered the blue hidden in indigo leaves thousands of years ago, I'm exploring and charting my relationship to the world I inhabit in a way that is as is in a way that is at once so old and is still always new. The color revealed in a plant's leaves through the simple gesture of crushing it in our hands is also a real profound reminder of our human histories, traditions, and systems of making that for millennia have transformed immediately available materials into meals, utensils, clothing, tools, and even homes of profound beauty. Profound for the directness of their connection to the place just outside the door and the knowledge of living fully in that environment which they embody. There's also the inspiring fact that as these last few images show, indigo has been used by people and cultures across time to meet our physical and spiritual needs. But then there's a darker side to indigo's history as well. As Americans, we should all be well aware that indigo was woven into the cloth that was carried by European traders from India to the west coast of Africa to purchase the lives of others. Even more cruelly, the labor of growing, harvesting, and processing the dye became the very work to which many of these lives were brutally bound in the New World, while the cotton and indigo they grew was sent back to England to make more cloth, to both clothe the enslaved, and to buy more lives. This indigo is the context of our current global crisis, one for which we have a deep inability, and I think in the case of our own, in our, our own country here, a foundational inability to address. So as the context for our lives is part of a greater humanity, this indigo requires vigilance. It bears witness to the callousness of a global capitalism that when carried to its extremes equates humans to their labor, 
redefines citizens as consumers and outright lies to justify its means. Um, I could give a whole semester long course on this image and Adam Smith. And so I'm just gonna skip it and keep going here. Um, anyway, for better or for worse, I see indigo as the blue thread that really binds us all in a very deeply complex world. And I'm gonna come back to the complexity of this American textile here uh, at the end if I have some time. But first, um, I think it's really interesting, like uh, as an artist, um, I know when I was a student, I would hear people talk and I'm like, wow, that's so neat what you're doing. Um, how did you get there? So I came to Indigo and working with Indigo in a real roundabout way. After I graduated from college, um, I went to Japan to teach English. And at the time, I was very interested in photography. So I started a club at the high school where I taught and showed the kids how to develop and print black and white. This is all way pre-digital back in the 1990s. Um, and at the same time, I took lots of pictures of everything I saw because really everything was so visually different for me in my own experience growing up in suburban America. So after my first year there, I decided that I wanted to move out of this sort of brutalist style bunker of a, a teacher's apartment um, that my school had assigned me to. And so through some local connections, I found this abandoned farmhouse and I fixed it up and I moved in. And living in this house, as, as people had in pre-industrial Japan, it taught me a lot of things about myself and the society I had been raised in. Um, first of all, all the gray water from the house ran directly into the stream below. And asking around a bit, I learned that in my community in Japan at the time, all the wastewater other than sewage, uh, including all the chemicals that I was using in developing and printing photographs, was going directly into the stream that ran by my home. This made me aware of the direct connection between my living and making and the health of my immediate environment. And it's something that's really stuck with me because it was the first time where I saw for myself the distance that we put between our lives and the environment in the developed world as a sort of willful blindness towards the devastation and destruction that are ingrained in how we make and consume. So second, um, this, the, this house I was living in in Japan had been built of rocks, trees, bamboo, earth, and straw that were all gathered from the very place where it had been built. And so I'm gonna digress a little bit more um, to kind of underscore some of these points. Um, when I was in the sixth grade, my family moved from rural Vermont to suburban St. Louis from a home that had been designed and built by an eccentric Austrian carpenter to a typical Midwestern subdivision place uh, that was essentially the same as all the other houses on the street, just with different colored siding and the garage flip from the left side to the right side. Um, anyone who's lived in the Midwest uh, knows these places. This was a 13116 Hunter Creek Ridge Road. And while there was a ridge and there was a road, there certainly was no creek, nor were there any hunters. These were merely vacuous commercial conceits, a skill with words developed over years of learning, cynically applied in marketing departments, where teams of wordsmiths conjured an idealized sense of pastoral self-sufficiency to sell subdivision houses. In vivid contrast, my house in Japan, uh, to, uh, in vivid contrast to my house in Japan, our old house in St. Louis was made of the same pre-cut industrial lumber, two by fours, plywood, and drywall that are the ubiquitous evidence of our own culture of industrial production and consumption that is so very far removed from the hunter and the ridge and the creek. This, in his, in his uh, powerful book, What Color is the Sacred? Anthropologist Michael Tossig makes the same point through color naming conventions. Tossig directs our eyes to the paint store, he says, where there's no lavender in lavender blue, or turquoise in turquoise blue, the same goes for gentian blue, violet blue, cornflower blue, reed green, apple green, olive green, almond green, emerald green, you get the idea. So living in this house showed me, like I said earlier, that the historical root of all craft is found in the manipulation of materials from one's immediate environment. And in the light of the global scale of contemporary manufacture, these historical materials and processes can be seen anew. Growing up amidst the consumerism of suburban America, I, I'd always felt that life was missing some kind of fundamental reason for being, where we all really just here to go buy stuff from the mall. And it was through living in this house that I discovered um, that reason or meaning for myself in the way that craft traditions, like the one I work with, can really shrink the distances of material extraction and production to the distance of our own hands. So... I wanted to bring even just a small bit of this uh, craft knowledge back with me from Japan. 
And so when my teaching contract was up, I moved to Tokushima, where I did a two-year apprenticeship. And the first year, I spent learning to farm and process uh, indigo into the traditional Japanese dye stuff known as sukumo, which I'll explain in a minute. And then the second year was spent with the Fudusho family learning to make the traditional fermentation vat as well as uh, other resist techniques. And this apprenticeship was really the start of my art education um, because it was really all about doing, about tacit knowledge gained through action over words. A good example of this is one day in the midst of turning a giant pile of composting indigo leaves, like you see here, um, work that I had been doing day in and day out for weeks, my teacher, Mr. Nee, snapped at me to get the tool that we needed for the next task. I know I responded a bit irritated, kind of like my kids do when I remind them to like feed the chickens or take the dogs out. And he shot back right away, no, you don't, and said, if you knew, you would have already gotten it. So this knowledge is physical that I'm talking about. It's knowledge is action and action over words. So this is a question I get asked a lot, and I'm going to try and answer here with some relative uh, simplicity. Why uh, grow Japanese indigo in America? Um, this is a very simplified uh, uh, version um, so that I, this is another thing I could talk for hours about. So I'm going to try and keep it simple. Um, this is a map that shows the eight main indigo plants uh, grown around the world. There are um, others and there are subspecies and so on, but this is a general breakdown. And while, again, this is a bit of a generalization, you can divide these types of indigo into two basic groups. Um, group one is extracted indigos, which are found mainly in tropical and subtropical regions. And extracted indigo is made by steeping the leaves of an indigo bearing plant in water until they decompose. And then uh, the remaining plant materials, materials removed and lime is added and that liquid is beaten to introduce oxygen, which causes the indigo to oxidize and eventually settle to the bottom of the bat. And the resulting dye stuff's probably about 40 to 50% indigo when dried. And um, when dried, it can also be easily cut into little rectangular cakes, which were then easy to pack and ship around the world and hence very attractive to European merchants in the 17th uh, 18th and 19th centuries. The other uh, main group of indigo plants is concentrated indigos. Uh, this process uses drying and composting of some sort to burn off excess plant material and hence concentrate the dye found in the plants. And this largely developed in temperate regions, mainly of Europe and East Asia, although there are some similarities to the process uh, used in West Africa with Longicarpus, which is another uh, indigo bearing plant. And while I can only speak uh, with firsthand experience of Japanese indigo, the resulting dye stuff has a much lower concentration of dye per volume, somewhere at best five to 10% if you're lucky. So um, with the indigo, extracted indigo, the indigo precipitate, you have a much more uh, concentrated dye stuff that you could then, uh, because it's concentrated, you could ship, ship it around the world. This stuff is looks like dirt. Um, and if you didn't know, you might mistake it for just composted dirt. So um, it's very, very bulky. And that bulkiness um, that of this dye stuff, it was made it or just a very inefficient material that did not lend itself for compact shipping. Um, although that's probably only one factor as to why these concentrated indigos were largely ignored by European colonizers and traders. Um, so I want to dig uh, into this a bit deeper because um, in talking about indigo writ large, it seems important to point out that the history of indigo, uh, to point out the history of indigo in Europe. Um, you know, we might think that Europeans were starting indigo plantations with slave labor all over the world because they were intoxicated by some rare or exotic color that they couldn't get at home. This is just totally not true. Europe, in fact, had its own indigo industry built around the woad plant. But making it was such dirty work that the wadis, as the woad producers in England were called, were a segregated caste of workers and were only allowed to marry other wadis. Woad held its ground until the 19th century when the inexpensive imports from Europe's South Asian and New World colonies finally rendered Woad economically unfeasible. Protectionist policies outlawing the use of imported indigo and dyers being creative in developing these mixed dye vats that added the concentrated extracted indigo from the colonies to their Woad vats. All of these things just weren't enough to fend off that powerful mix of state-sponsored capitalism 
in the form of land expropriation and slavery, which led to industrial scale farming and extremely low production costs for colonial indigo, with which European woad farmers and many of their indigenous counterparts around the world simply could not compete. The history of indigo um, in Japan, though, is a little bit different. So from the late 17th to late 19th centuries, Japan had a closed country policy that kept European colonizers and their trading goods, including indigo, at bay. And at the same time, there were sumptuary, co sumptuary codes that limited some 90% of the population to wearing uh, clothing of simple muted colors, including blue. So together in Japan, these two factors of the, the uh, closed country and the sumptuary codes combined to foster the immensely rich and still living traditions of indigo there. Um, so to better understand where I'm coming from, um, I think it helps to have some understanding of the process that I used to make the make the blue that colors my work. Um, it's a long process. It spans a year, which gives me a lot of time to think about what I'm doing and informing uh, the, the decisions that I make in my work. Um, I'm going to go through a year pretty quickly here. Uh, Japanese indigo, Persicaria tinctoria, um, is an annual that it's got to be planted every year. So in the fall, after the plants have been harvested twice, we leave them to blossom. They're pollinated by bees and then they go to seed. When the seeds have had plenty of time to ripen and the plants have then been killed by a hard freeze in the fall, we gather those seed heads and winnow, uh, dry them and winnow them so that in the spring, uh, they're ready for planting. So in late March, uh, we plant the seeds in seedling beds like this in, uh, in a cold frame to protect them from uh, late frost. And when those seedlings are about six to eight inches tall, they're then pulled up and gathered for transplanting into the fields. They're planted in bunches of about five to six plants, about a foot between each bunch of plants and about just under uh, three feet left between each row. As those plants grow, we mound soil up around the base of the plants and um, Persicaria tinctoria has a noted stem that sends out new roots from each node. So as you mound soil up around that, it promotes root growth and makes for very sturdy sturdy, strong plants. So when you go to harvest them, you don't just rip them out of the ground. Um, when the leaves are a pretty good size and the plants are about two to three feet tall, then they're ready for harvesting. And we cut them leaving an inch or two of stem so that they'll grow again so we can get a second harvest. And those cut plants are then spread out in the sun to dry. And as the plants dry, um, you can see the green plants on the left of the image here and, the, and uh, as they dry, the leaves turn blue. Um, the ones that have turned blue already were out drying for a whole day already. Um, and the dye in this indigo plant is found only in the leaves. So it's necessary to winnow the leaves from the stems in order to make a, a real high quality dye stuff. Um, so to easily remove those dye bearing leaves, we just wait for this perfect timing when the leaves are dry and brittle, but the stems are so flexible. And then we quickly gather up the plants, put them in a big pile and stomp on them with our feet to winnow the leaves. And then once the leaves are crushed, we remove the stems first with a pitchfork and then by hand. And then all the remaining leaves are gathered and uh, we bag them and um, stockpile those dried leaves as we work through uh, first and second harvest from each field. The stems themselves get mulched back on the field to feed future crops. And then um, in the fall, once all the indigo has been harvested and temperatures have cooled off, we begin the composting process that concentrates the dye found in the leaves. So this involves moistening the dried leaves with water. Um, this work happens on a clay surface floor that's designed to wick away any excess moisture from the pile of composting leaves so that the leaves on the bottom of that pile don't just rot. Um, like I said, it's a hot composting process and at its peak, it heats up to over 140 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and then once a week, the piles turned to break up clumps that form and add more water and oxygen in order to make sure that it composts evenly. And because the pile's hot and moist, then uh, and the outside air is cold, uh, when we turn the pile, you can see it puts off a lot of steam. Um, and we keep the pile covered with burlap sacks, burlap sacks as it gets older um, or as it gets colder out over the winter to help it maintain its heat. Um, so each week when we turn the pile, first we have to uncover it, and then we just sort of systematically slice through it. The clumps are broken up, more water is added, and then uh, as it's turned, it's exposed to more oxygen in the air. And then once we're done uh, doing that, we put it back in place, it's covered, and then we let it uh, sleep again for another week. 
And at the end of a hundred days of composting, um, where where the the dye stuff called sukumo is uh, complete. And like I said, really, it just looks like dirt. Uh, we then weigh it and bag it for future use based on the size of the the vats that we use. Um, so after about ten months uh, after planting seeds, we're finally ready to start dyeing. And I'll take you through this process quickly too. If you're familiar with indigo dyeing, you're aware that you need three things for the process to work. First, you need the indigo molecules themselves, which you just saw where ours came from. Then you need an alkali because indigo won't dissolve in water. And finally, you need reduction as the dye will only adhere to fibers in its reduced state. So our indigo comes from the process I just explained. The alkali that we use comes from burning wood to make ash. And that ash is then sifted to remove any charcoal. And then it's mixed with boiling water and stirred and left to settle overnight. Um, and this strong alkali is siphoned off and the process is repeated using the same ash until we have five separate batches of this wood ash lye. Um, and then we take the weakest batches of that lye and mix them with lime, which is another alkali. And to that liquid, we add the composted indigo. There we are adding that in and we, um, and then to hasten the fermentation, um, which is what provides the third thing you need for indigo dyeing, the reduction of the molecules that, that make that dyeing possible. We boil a small amount of wheat bran and add that to the vat as food for the bacteria that's already in the composted indigo that causes the fermentation. And then every morning and evening for the next uh, few days, we check the vat and we stir it. And if all goes well on the fourth or fifth day or so, the vat begins to ferment and a purple metallic film starts to form on the surface of the liquid like you see here. So at this point, the vat's still only half full and it needs to be filled before we can do any dyeing. So each day over the next three days, these stronger batches of wood ash lye are added to the vat. There we go, until it's filled and ready for dyeing. And because these vats are living, um, dyeing things not only removes color, but it also removes the bacteria necessary to keep them alive. So there's really only so much material that can be dyed each day in these vats. Um, anyway, after all that work to get from seed to dye, uh, the dyeing part is actually really easy. The material you're going to dye is wet out and immersed in the vat. And then once the dye is adhered to it inside the vat, it's removed and allowed to oxidize. And you repeat that process to build up color. And then um, once you've got the desired shade that you want, that cloth is then rinsed and finished. Um, and because indigo isn't soluble in water, the, remain, it, the blue remains in the cloth while all the other impurities from the composted indigo wash out. And you can kind of see the brown coming out there in the water as it's washed. And then at the end of its lifespan, the vat gets spread back onto the indigo fields to fertilize future crops. Um, but I can only really spread so much of this on any given field each year before it becomes too much of a good thing and my soil becomes jeopardized. Like the limits imposed by the living vats, as I was saying a minute ago, um, so you can only die so much um, at each time. This is another limitation that keeps me in check. I'm always aware that if I do too much, it's not some abstract idea of the environment that I'm messing with. It's literally my own, my own backyard or front yard, really. Um, so on some, um, oh, I don't know, here we go. So, um, I feel like there are kind of two main questions that help illuminate uh, some of my work. And the first one is simply why indigo? And for me, I think one of the most striking aspects of craft and textiles in particular is, is their um, inherent humanity, right? Textiles and their production were historically rooted in the basic activities of daily life. And then cloth and indigo in particular wasn't just one person's brilliant ideas. Um, so as we, you know, I didn't, I didn't come up with this process that I use. This is something that I studied and people have done for hundreds and hundreds of years. So as we engage in the activities of, of, uh, of indigo and cloth production, um, we really forge connections across time to all the other people who have ever worked with this dye and these processes. Like I said, the process that I work with today isn't mine. It was developed over hundreds of years. And it's similar to other indigo processes developed by people all around the world. Um, in working with indigo and growing it, processing and dying with it, my actions recreate those of my predecessors, connecting me to them through the movements and labor and time given to make and color cloth. And I think for all of us engaged in, in this type of work, the meaning and weight of these connections may differ for each of us, but I think that recognizing them is important because it's in these connections that 
lies the origins of our work as well as its originality. So that discovery of blue and the leaves of a plant and the amazement it brings uh, has captivated me for uh, 25 years now. And over time, my artistic output shifted from resist dyed textiles to direct engagement, getting people and out there uh, from my community to work with Indigo and have a firsthand experience with it, to installation that brings in aspects of the process that leads from seed to dye. And yet throughout all these very different types of work, my goal has been the same, which is to get the indigo that I use out into the world and into the lives of others, while also using it to empower others by sharing the meaning that it's brought to my life. Because for me, there's a wonder and awe to be found in a connection to something that's bigger than myself, something that was here long before my time and that will be around long after we're gone. So if my first question was why indigo, uh, I'm, I want to go back to this because I didn't really answer it. Uh, you know, why why Japanese uh, indigo in America is probably my second one. Um, this is one way of asking it, but it's also a question of why work with this particular indigo process. And to answer this question, I'd like to go um, back to American coverlets, which I hinted at, um, as well as touch on some of my recent work for a minute. Um, about two years ago, I was involved in a ghost lab project with a large group of faculty, students, and community members uh, from, uh, from this area that looked at a historical mill in Southern Indiana. And the project forced me to understand the impacts of our broader history on a very local level. Uh, in At Home in the Hoosier Hills, which is the book that looks at the settlement and development of Southern Indiana, where I live from the early 1800s to the Civil War, its author, Richard Nation, gives us a very different pair of glasses with which to understand agriculture is the foundation of our independence. He writes, because the early white settlers imagined Southern Indiana as a place where the land could sustain them and their families, as a place where they could achieve independence, as a place for farms, they demanded the removal of those, the indigenous peoples who did not use the land as the European Americans thought fit, as independent yeoman farmers. So the agriculture of our independence is extractive and it was exclusive and independence achieved through the suppression and disenfranchisement of other peoples and ways of life. For hundreds of years, we, by which I mean white European Americans, as well as all those who adhere to the gospel of capitalism, have wrapped ourselves in these misconceived and delusional visions, warming our bodies with these foundational lies that misrepresent everything from the basic sources of our materials to how we achieved our independence. So back to my question of why this indigo process in this place. On one level, I use this process because it evolved in a similar temperate climate to where I live and is therefore a natural fit that doesn't require additional inputs to get it to work. I mean, imagine trying to grow tropical indigo here. On another level, um, I like the fact that I'm not really in control. At best, I'm partnering with this plant and my environment because together they exert their agency over me. They dictate when I plant seeds or when I transplant or when I harvest uh, or when I compost. Um, this is a means of creating that I can really believe in. But beyond these things, as an artist, I grow indigo and make dye not as a commodity or as a commercial undertaking, but rather as a way of living fully in the world. I believe deeply in the futility of my work, of using a very labor intensive process to make something that is intangible and immaterial, color. In 2022, 2023 now, this is an artistic affront to the nearly religious conviction in our own culture that bigger, faster, and cheaper are somehow always better. Um, in the few minutes that I have left, I wanna talk a bit more about some recent work that I've done. For the past, uh, six or seven years I've been working with fading. And I've always been deeply moved by the idea of impermanence and fading is just an excellent metaphor because it's, to me, it's so much more than the loss of color. So the first work I did um, with fading marked the time it took to make the dye. So on the day that I planted indigo seeds in 2015, I put the dyed cloth out in my greenhouse for exposure where they then sat for the 280 days it took to grow and process that year's crop until January 5th. 2016. And these are some of the works from that. As photographic exposures, these works embody a beautiful contradiction. In capturing the time required to make the dye, the color itself is lost. 
Yet at the same time, that loss isn't really a loss. It's more akin to breathing. There's an exchange as light, air, and life are inhaled by the cloth, and the color is slowly exhaled into the surrounding environment, such that we are in this dye and it is in us. So I was uh, more fully able to realize this idea in an installation called Aino Keshiki Indigo Views, from, uh, which is a project in 2018 in which I worked with the Cultural Affairs Division of Tokushima Prefecture and invited participants to live with a small piece of cloth dyed with indigo grown and processed in Tokushima for five months, allowing its color to enter their lives through the process of fading, while at the same time capturing their experiences as in the mark left where the color had faded. So the cloths were placed in these special boxes I designed that mirrored a camera to control the exposure and create a uniformity and hence visual connection across all the different cloths. And these were brought together again for an installation in Tokushima that places the viewer inside that fading box from the cloth's cloth perspective. The installation included a sound component by Norbert Herber that used the small speakers placed inside the actual boxes um, that we use for fading to reflect the variations of fading that was happening visually within each cloth. Ins this installation was included um, in the Smithsonian American Art Museum's 2020 Renwick Invitational. The work, including the sound, was reconfigured to fit the space, and we worked with a lighting expert to develop, to develop lighting that changed almost imperceptibly over time, very slowly becoming darker and lighter and shifting up and down, moving the shadows of the cloth across space, much like the, the sun had moved um, across the cloth um, when it was being faded. So when the, um, when the exhibit closed, all of the cloth was returned to participants. And this is something that I've gotten very interested in doing um, things that um, at the end of the day, I'm left with nothing, uh, which I, I really like. Again, there's no, there's no artwork to be commodified from it. Um, over the time that I've been working with fading, um, as I was saying earlier, I've also been researching coverlets. And I got interested in coverlets because of this distinctly North American textile that embraced indigo and were common very common where I live in Indiana. You still find them in antique stores here. Um, and many of them contain patriotic imagery and slogans that paint a very one-sided view of our history, as I was saying earlier. But examine more closely, these deeply American textiles were made by interweaving cotton grown by slaves and spun in Northeastern mills with local wool steeped in the indigo matter, cochineal and Brazil wood of colonial globalism. These were not domestically produced dyes. The material content of these textiles speaks much more directly to our nation's history than any visual stories they tell, and yet we continue to believe in image over substance. So Unbound was my initial reaction to this, a series of experimental works created by weaving historical American coverlet patterns into a ground cloth based on the cotton plaids and checks that were integral to the triangle trade. Exposed for fading and then selectively um, unwoven, these textiles, for me, are really a meditation on the process of historicization um, and the formation of our national identity and the prevailing culture of the image. So all these works are mounted on linen that was stretched on frames that were quickly built from inexpensive cedar. And I added an empty frame next to um, some of the mounted weavings. It was accidental at first, um, but that empty frame left me with the overwhelming feeling of sadness that I experience in the spaces behind big box stores or strip malls. You guys ever accidentally driven around behind one of those uh, places? Um, there are spaces where, you know, the spaces where deliveries are made and, and trash is discarded. But they're also really the space where the facade of our consumer culture is lifted and the kind of uh, brutal reality of its emptiness is exposed. And so although it was accidental that I just had a front one empty frame hanging on the wall, uh, I, I, I paired them 
uh, with the with the works this way. But um, so that we don't end on a note of doom and gloom, um, I uh, I like to think of the work that I do as looking back to the historical model of the indigo that I use to challenge our status quo and to present an option for moving forward both societally and environmentally. Um, I didn't get into the work that I do because I want to grow indigo and dye, you know, genes on an industrial scale here in Bloomington, Indiana. Um, I, I got into it because I believe that it, it just value lies elsewhere. As an artist, um, first of all, I don't see indigo as a commodity. If I did, I'd never grow it because I can buy the equivalent of what I can grow and process in a year as natural indigo extract for around uh, two to $300 at current retail rates. Just as the type of indigo I use was passed over historically because of its bulk and low dye concentration, it will never be a viable, a viable alternative to, to synthetic indigo or less expensive indigo precipitate. And honestly, I don't want it to be. Like I said, I believe that its value lies elsewhere in its connection to the land and my immediate environment and in its connection to everyone across time whose collective labor has given form to the plants and process that I use and to those individuals and institutions who continue to share and expand craft knowledge through their actions in and on the world. As I said earlier, I also find great meaning in investing so much time and energy in creating something as immaterial as color. It's another gesture of extreme futility and a profound metaphor for all um, human endeavor. So really at the end of the day, my own bottom line comes down to me as an individual and the day-to-day -day actions that I take in the world as a farmer, as a dyer, as an educator, a parent, a neighbor. So I'll continue to tend my own garden and offer the work that I do as one small act of resistance against what I see as a world of radically misplaced values, as well as a quiet suggestion that we can craft our world as we'd like it to be. Um, so with that, I will say thank you and um, stop sharing my screen and I open things up for any questions that you have. Let's see. Thank you so much, Roland. That was brilliant. Um, it was so exciting to hear just... Oops. Can... Sorry, Karen, I could not, oh. I had my volume down, turned down oh. to control oh. the sound from the presentation, so. Can you hear me now? Yep. Okay, I just wanted to say thank you so much. This was a really brilliant presentation. Um, I think that, you know, the historical context, the incredible, um, um, the incredible way that you interwove all of the issues around around indigo within the United States and within Japan and a world context is exactly exactly what I wanted. I wanted people to get a chance to experience. Um, if anyone has any questions, please. Um, well, actually, you know what I'm going to have? It's, it's a relatively small group. So I'm going to, let me try to, um, have people turn on their cameras and that they, they can raise their hand or raise a hand in the, in, um, in the reactions box and, Let's have a little conversation. Oh, let's see. Oh. Yeah. Did you want us to unmute or say it in the question oh. box? I got distracted. No, no. no, you can unmute. Everyone can unmute now. Thanks. Um, and if you have a question, raise your hand and let and I'll call on you. Jane. Well, oh, thank you. <laughs> um, I'm curious about your your family's and how you your family's engagement with the pro project. If you don't mind me asking something so personal. Oh no, that's great. Um, 
So, you know, my kids are kids. They kind of hate it. <laughs> we had them out there working in the fields when they were young and they'd much rather be on video games. Um, although our oldest is starting to get interested again. Um, but, you know, my wife, uh, Chinami, is a weaver and she weaves ecot uh, yardage for kimono and obi. And we work together to grow indigo. And then um, up until very, up until actually just very recently, we've always worked independently. Um, and so uh, we would work together to make the dye, but then she would take it and do her thing with it. I would take it and do my thing with it. Um, but we just finished an, uh, a, a large uh, installation that combines her knowledge of ECAT with, with my work with installation. Um, and so that's been really fun and kind of opened up a whole new world. But we, it, I mean, it does dictate our family's life. Like we, you know, there's certain times of year when we have to plant or harvest or, or, or you know, like when we're composting, you can't go out of town for a hundred days because you've got that work to do. So I don't know if that answers your question, but. Yeah, it, it, it absolutely does. I mean, there's no right or wrong answer. I'm just so interested in um, the way in which, um, you know, this process this uh, the the creative process the growing everything it's just all kind of woven together in a life um in a, what seems to me a really beautiful also arduous <laughs> life um and i think it's such a wonderful example for our students of um you know of total commitment but also of a really sustainable and thoughtful and sensitive um, and equitable um, approach to art making practice and living. So thank you. Yeah, thanks. Janet. So it looked like from the images you showed that you there are other people besides just your family who work with you. Are there neighbors or do you hire them? They, and are they seasonal? Yeah, so it, it, it depends. Like I've done projects. One of the first things I did um, after moving to Bloomington was start a project called Into Growing Blue, which um, I just invited anyone who wanted to join in. And um, and so some of the pictures are from then when, when the community would come out. And the idea was that they would like, people would have this experience of growing the plants and then working all the way through to, to dyeing something with it at the end. Um, Right now in the summer, I usually um, get help from one or two graduate students um, or undergrad students. You know, students will always reach out and say like, hey, I'm really interested in doing this. I'm gonna be around this summer. Uh, can, can I help you out? And so I'll hire um, students who are interested in learning about the process. Um, and then in the studio, I have one part-time assistant who helps out as well. And we do hire more like this project we just completed um, and just hung last week in Seattle. We were, that was like a five month project and we hired two or three other people and we hired our kids. We hired everybody. We're like, we just need extra hands to make this thing happen. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Barbara. Am I unmuted? Yes. I don't know anyone else who so beautifully goes from the soil to the seed, to the to the growing, and through to such incredible, beautiful, sensitive, quiet, and profound work. That's not a question. <laughs> um, the question would be, how do you do it? How do you do it all? Um, but um, and teach. I think that's just remarkable. Well, I, I think um, I often joke that, like, on some level, my like artwork is a refuge. I make spaces that I'd like to be in that are often very calm uh, because my life is definitely not calm <laughs> by by any stretch of the imagination so so I maybe I'm kind of creating fantasy spaces for myself um, that are that are very calm and and uh, simple because life is not uh -huh. that's good to, I'm going to take that to heart thank you Judith. First, thank you, Karen, for organizing this and Roland for your thoughtful winding of thoughts and reflections. Um, I'm curious within the way that you think about the ecology of, of soil and of histories, 
um, ar around indigo specifically, if if you can share anything about how you're able to bring that kind of thinking into the classroom, into the structures of semester assignments, those sorts of things that often feel like they're kind of fighting against teaching a relational way of being and teaching slow and integrated practices. Um, I wonder just if you'd share anything that you found really helpful in insisting on that inside of educational institutions, or if you want to share any glorious failures, I'm happy to hear that too. Thanks. Yeah, you know, it is. It, uh, thanks, Judith. It's great to see you. Um, the uh, it, it's a it is a it is really a challenge because the structure of the institution and the semester and the academic year is really almost the exact opposite, right? Like, I transplant typically on graduation weekend, right? And then there's all the work in the field and the harvesting and all the stuff that happens in the student while in the summer while students are gone. So it's very hard to incorporate that into a class. Um, and it's something that I've struggled with having learned as an apprentice where that's just what you do day in and day out. And you're focused on that one thing. You know, our students are taking lots of different classes and there's all these things competing for their attention just within school, let alone outside of school. Um, so it is a really big challenge. And it's actually something I was talking with my my colleagues this morning about because we're trying to figure out we run a dye garden here on campus and we we really try to have all the classes in the fibers area involved with it. Um, but it's a similar challenge. So how do we get them out there to get to do a, a early spring cleanup and and uh, seed planting? And um, it often feels like with those things, we're trying to shoehorn it into this system and structure that it is really not, um, it doesn't support it, right? It, it supports something really different. Um, but at the same time, I, like this semester, I'm teaching a class for the second time. It's a 200 level class and it's just called How Things Are Made, the Sock. And we, um, so we're not working with dyes at all, but we are, students are learning about global production and consumption of socks and other textiles and garments, while also uh, from uh, locally, from raw wool from a local farm, uh, knitting a sock on their own and charting their time and looking at that. And, you know, it's kind of something we don't allow ourselves to do in academia to say, okay, we're going to take a whole semester. We're going to make, and we're only making one sock. We're not even making a pair of socks. You're making one sock because there's a lot to learn. They got to learn how to, you know, scour and card and spin and ply and, um, and then knit. And um, it's actually really fantastic in the classroom to open up that time where we're all sitting together, working together, learning together, and having the time just to talk. We're not like, okay, we've got to finish this thing in two weeks, and then in two weeks, we got to do this whole new thing. Um, and as a teacher as well, it's really wonderful. It's allowed me to just like take a deep breath and and spend and be more um, intentional and, and, and carve out that time. Because if we don't carve it out, it's not going to get carved out. Um, so that's just really a, like a, a radical simplification um, and doing doing less in throughout in the arc of a semester, which is actually I feel like doing more because of the conversations and things that it can foster amongst that group. So that's something that I'm kind of excited about right now. It's the second time I've taught it, and that that sort of challenging the system to say no, 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 we don't have to do as much all the time. We're just going to do this one thing and really think deeply about it is been um, helpful for me because I do struggle. I know exactly what you're talking about and I do struggle with that, making the, making it all work. Yeah. Thank you, Roland. I think our time is up now. Thank you, Judith. That was the perfect question to end on, I think, <laughs> as we struggle. Um, I just want to thank you from everyone. I'd like everyone to, if you can, turn on your camera and just let Roland see the faces connected, see the students that are, that are there and just thank you so much. Can I hold yeah, up that while you talked about that, I was darning a sock. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> <laughs>
Thank beautiful. Thank you, Roland. Thank you, Karen. It was Thanks, great. everyone, so much. Thank you so much. Karen, I'm just going to stick around to say bye to you. Yeah, yeah. That was great. Terrific. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. I want to, um, can you email me your number and we can hopefully connect yeah. in Seattle? Okay. I, I think I have it, but. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everything's so great to see you. you. Yeah. I mean. The kids want to see you. They ask about you all the time. Oh so. My God. Oh my God. You're they're huge. On and, it's actually March 7th is Anand's 18th birthday. So. Oh no. Yeah. Yeah. Whoa, it's been He's like long. as tall as I am. Oh yeah, it's been that long. God. Yeah. Oh, so oh, well, we have to make this work. The yeah, yeah. this breakfast has to happen. Oh, oh. So looking forward to seeing you. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much for this. This is exactly what I what I want. Is I just want a whole. I want a whole different level of looking at looking at practice as as a sustainable grounded action yep and i feel that as i love judith's question at the end because i want the yeah. same for education and it yeah. feels like we're just rushing 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 to check boxes and mm -hmm. yeah so right. awesome this has been wonderful i really okay. appreciate the opportunity and we'll we'll um we'll make we it happen see each other in seattle, seattle. okay in week. that's yeah. awesome that's wonderful. I know. You take I care, know. Karen. Okay. Bye-bye. Great to see you.